Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. tells the following true story. Longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood, Christina wanted to see the world. Discontent with a home having only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin, and a wood-burning stove, she dreamed of a better life in the city. One morning she slipped away, breaking her mother's heart. Knowing what life on the streets would be like for her young, attractive daughter, Maria hurriedly packed to go find her. On her way to the bus stop, she entered a drugstore to get one last thing, pictures. She sat in the photograph booth, closed the curtain, and spent all she could on pictures of herself. With her purse full of small black and white photos, she boarded the next bus to Rio de Janeiro. Maria knew Christina had no way of earning money. She also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up. And when pride meets hunger, a human will do things that were before unthinkable. Knowing this, Maria began her search. Bars, hotels, nightclubs, any place with the reputation for streetwalkers or prostitutes, she went to the mall. And at each place, she left her picture taped on a bathroom mirror, tacked to a hotel bulletin board, fastened to a corner phone booth. And on the back of each photo, she wrote a note. It wasn't too long before both the money and the pictures ran out and Maria had to go home. The weary mother wept as the bus began its long journey back to her small village. It was a few weeks later that young Christina descended the, descended the hotel stairs where she had been living. Her young face was tired. Her brown eyes no longer danced with youth but spoke of pain and fear. Her laughter was broken. Her dream had become a nightmare. A thousand times over she had longed to return home, yet the little village was in too many ways too far away. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eyes noticed a familiar face. She looked again, and there on the lobby mirror was a small picture of her mother. Christina's eyes burned, her throat tightened as she walked across the room and removed the small photo. Written on the back was this compelling invitation. Whatever you have done, whatever you have become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And she did. The cross tells everyone to please come home. Regardless of what you've done or become, the gospel saves anyone who believes. No person is beyond the reach of God's grace. No person is beyond the power of God to save. We gain a home in heaven by faith. Have you believed that Christ died for your sins and rose again? As Paul told the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Luke 15 verses 11 through 12 read, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. The parable of the prodigal son is the third parable of Luke 15. The first one, in verses 3 through 7, is a story about a man who lost one of his 100 sheep. He searches for it and finds his sheep and brings it home rejoicing. After he gets home, he calls his friends and neighbors together so they can all rejoice together because the lost sheep was found and that one sheep was important and had value. Then the Lord said in verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. 
Christ then told a second story about a woman who lost one of her ten pieces of silver. She searched her home high and low. She used the candlelight and swept the house thoroughly until at last she found the coin. She was so happy that she called her friends and neighbors over so they could all rejoice together because the lost coin was found and that one coin was important and had value. Then the Lord said in verse 10, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. The salvation of one sinner generates joy among the angels in heaven and brings joy to the heart of God. God is not waiting for 10,000 sinners to start the celebration. He's not waiting for a thousand or a hundred or ten. Rejoicing in heaven over, occurs over each and every single person who gets saved because each person is precious, important, and has value to God. When something that is lost is found, that is cause for rejoicing. And this leads the Lord into the parable of the prodigal son, which teaches the same, except this parable is about a person being lost and then found. In verse 11, the Lord began the parable by telling about a certain man who had two sons. In verse 12, we see the younger son asking his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And then the father divided unto them his living. According to the Mosaic law, the elder son would receive twice as much of his father's estate as the other sons at his death. By asking for his inheritance while his father lived, it was like the younger son saying that he wished his father was dead. The younger son wanted his freedom and independence and decided he wanted to leave his father's house and he did not want to wait until the time when his father would die to receive his inheritance, so he requested his portion of it ahead of time. He wanted his cut right now. And he didn't want an ongoing relationship with the family. He didn't want to take over his inheritance and begin to develop it and use it for the good of the family in the future. He just wanted his portion of the goods so he could leave. Without any arguing or pleading, his father divided and gave his younger son his share. The money received was because of a generous father. And everything this younger son had, his father had given to him. Luke 15 verses 13 to 16 read, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Wanting probably to stretch his wings and probably thinking that life would be somehow better and the grass would be greener somewhere else, he strikes out, travels to a far country. He ran far away from his father's house. He tries to get his far away from accountability as he could, far away from restraint, far away from scrutiny, interference from home. He wanted to get far away so he could live exactly the way he wanted to, and nobody that cared about him would ever know. Not many days later, uh, as it says there, indicates the speed by which the younger son acts after he received his inheritance. He was driven by evil desires and passions and passions and there's no delay here he wanted to get moving and leave as fast as he could he left quickly with his pockets full of money and once he was gone he lived fast without restraint spent his money without thought the term prodigal means wasteful and we see that this is what the younger son was and did in the far country, he wasted his money with riotous living, which refers to being recklessly extravagant. And in a very short amount of time, the prodigal wasted and spent 
all his money. It's been said, money talks, but all mine ever says is goodbye. And that was true of the prodigal son. A day came that he reached into his pockets and there wasn't anything left. After he had spent everything, a mighty and severe famine occurs in that far country. He was in a bad way financially, and now the country that he was in was in a bad way because of the famine. Where he thought the grass was greener was now all dried up. Painful reality and consequences to his actions begin to catch up with the prodigal. His resources have run out, and he suddenly finds himself all alone. When he was the life of the party and had money, he had fair-weather friends, and they were all around him. But when the money ran out and the party was over and the famine hit and he was in need, these people were nowhere to be found. The famine that gripped the land caused a food shortage, and he began to be in want, and he found himself destitute. He was desperate. So he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Now the word joined is an interesting word. It means to glue or to cleave. It shows you that the prodigal became a beggar. He found some citizen in this far country and in his begging he glued himself to this guy. And this citizen, probably trying to get rid of him, sends him into the field to feed his swine. The far country the prodigal had run away into was Gentile territory, and the citizen he glued himself to was a Gentile because he owned pigs. This young Jewish man had dipped to his lowest level. As the only work he could get was by begging and to work for a Gentile feeding swine. Now, this would have been something that was particularly detestable to a Jew. This was definitely not kosher. This would have caused the listeners to Christ's parable to just wince in pain and to listen to that. A Hebrew couldn't go any lower. Jews were forbidden to eat swine. They were unclean, and it was unlawful to keep them also. But the prodigal was desperate, the Lord was showing. This work didn't provide him with much, and he began to hunger. In his wrenching hunger, even the food he was feeding the pigs started to look really appetizing and good. And he began to envy the pig's food of husks, or literally carob bean pods. Life in the world was not what the prodigal expected. As verse 16 says that no man gave unto him. In the reality of the prodigal situation, he found that nobody really cared about him. And nobody wanted to help him. And at this point, he has hit bottom. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Growing in God's Grace is a paperback 96-page book written by Pastor John Fredrickson. The studies found in this book are intended to help any believer grow in their knowledge of key subjects in the Scripture. More importantly, we desire that each reader be assisted in their spiritual growth, considering how the Savior wants to transform their lives by their yielding to the will of God, as revealed in the Holy Bible. May we begin in earnest a lifelong journey of growing in God's grace and growing up unto Him in all things. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. This is the picture of the sinner. Spiritually poor, destitute, a beggar, spiritually hungry, hopeless, debauched, and dying. 
Sin is rebellion against God. And the story shows that God allows the freedom for the sinner to take their sin as far in any direction as they choose to take it. We see here the rebellion of one who ran away from the one who gave him life. He did not want a relationship with the one who could give him a future. Being a lost sinner is like the prodigal with his father. It is contempt for God's person, rule, authority, will, goodness, and resources. Out of rebellion, the, dis the sinner desires to run away from God to avoid all responsibility and accountability to him. The runaway sinner denies God any place in their life. They dishonor God by taking all the loving gifts that God has given and squanders them as far away from God as they can get. Living a life of sin, rebellion, and worldliness, one wastes their life in selfishness and looks for fulfillment outside and away from God and never finds it. It leaves the sinner, like the prodigal, exhausted, empty, hungry, lonely, lost, and hopeless. Luke 15, verses 17 to 24 read, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. The boy thought he'd find himself, but he only lost himself. But then in verse 17, it says he came to himself. In other words, he came to his senses. And he remembers the one who really did care about him, who really did love him, his father. He recalls how his father's servants were living better than he was. He realized that here I am, starving to death, when even my father's hired servants have more food than they need. They have bread enough and to spare, he said. This teaches us something about his father. His father was merciful, generous, and good. The prodigal begins to trust in his father's goodness, mercy, and compassion, which he scorned once, but now he recalls was always characteristic of his father. Thus, he determines to go back to his father, and he thinks about what he'd say to him ahead of time, that he knew that he had sinned and was unworthy to even be called his son, and that he would be glad just to be one of his hired servants if he would just take him back. But notice that the prodigal says, I will go to my father. It was not, I'll go back to my father's estate, or I'll go back to my father's house, or my father's riches. He says, I'll go back to my father. Most of all, he missed the relationship. Most of all, he wanted to be just back with his father, and he really did come to his senses. He humbles himself here. He knows that his sins were great. He knew that he sinned against his father in heaven and against his father on earth. He knows he is a great sinner. He would ask for no privileges, knowing that he's forfeited them all. He makes no claims. He doesn't assume that he will be restored into his father's house. All he wanted is mercy and was more than willing to be just one of his father's hired servants just to be able to come home. In verse 20, he got up and made the long journey back home to his father, walking back in his hungry, poor, filthy, dirty, swine-smelling, stinking state back toward the village. And verse 20 says, But when he was yet a great way off, 
still outside the village on a dusty road leading to home where he's a long way off, his father saw him. The father had been looking, straining his eyes, looking in the distance always. He had been watching and waiting, hoping for his son to come home. And if that isn't enough to show how much he loves his lost son, when he just sees his son coming a long way off, coming home, he rushes out the door to meet him. The word ran is the word for sprinting in a race. He bolts from the house, runs as fast as he can toward his son, all the way out to him, out of unconditional love, he ran because he wanted to get to his child as quickly as possible. And he does not come running toward him with his finger wagging at him, reprimanding him. I told you so, didn't I? If I told you once, I told you a thousand times. I warned you again and again and again. He doesn't do that at all. He came running with arms outstretched, tears streaming down his face, his heart full of love and compassion and emotion. And he grabbed his boy and threw his arms around him and embraced his dirty, pig-scented, long-lost son and kissed him happy beyond words that he had come home. Verse 21 is humorous to me. The son attempts to tell his rehearsed speech, but his father wouldn't have anything of it. The prodigal never makes it to the hired man part. The prodigal found that he didn't have to earn back his father's love. He didn't have to earn his reconciliation. He got grace and he got unconditional love. The father interrupts his son's speech and yells through tears of joy, my son needs something to wear. Get these rags off of him. Put a clean robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. Place new sandals on his feet. He looks hungry. Prepare a feast. Let's celebrate his return. My son was dead but now he lives. He was lost, but now he's found. And when you trust Christ as your personal Savior, the exact same thing is true of you. You were spiritually lost, but now you're found. You were spiritually dead, but now you live. The Father in the parable is God the Father. Through Christ, God the Son, we learn about God the Father's joy in the salvation of one lost sinner whom he runs to embrace and welcome home. We see how eager he is for any and all sinners to come to him in salvation. The prodigal son's father was patient. His eyes never stopped looking for his wayward son. He was loving as when he saw his son coming, he could not wait for his son to come to him. He ran to him, and he immediately embraced and kissed his child. He was forgiving, anxious to forgive his son. He did not even let him finish his plea. He was gracious. He honored his son, restored him, and celebrate, celebrated his return. He was merciful. The most important thing, was not that his son had taken advantage of him, not that he had told, caused him untold grief. It was that his son was alive, that he was found, and that he had come home. The patience, the love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy of this father is a picture of God the Father in his care and love toward lost sinners. And then also, and his kindness and grace, the son was immediately blessed by the father. It was right now, get the best robe, a robe of dignity. Let no time pass. Put it on him right now. It wasn't, you kind of stink. Go get a bath first. You get yourself cleaned up. The father immediately treats him like royalty, lavishes him, calls all the servants, says, take care of my son, dress him. And the son just stands there in amazement. Well, all this was done for him. The father said, put a ring on his finger. The rings weren't just for looks. They were used to press in soft wax and stamp the family symbol on official documents. This was authority being granted to the son to act in the father's name. Grace here 
triumphs over sin. Grace gave him dignity, privilege, and blessing. By grace, we too are robed, robed in the very righteousness of Christ, given authority as God's children to, uh, to work in the Father's name, consistent with his message of grace for today. And once the son had been given all these things, verse 23 says, bring the fatted calf, the father said. The wealthy back then often had one calf they kept to use for big and the best occasions. And it would feed many. It was a fatted calf, so it was reserved for large celebrations. By killing the fatted calf, the father was acknowledging that this is the best of occasions and reason to celebrate by all. Finding a lost sheep, finding a lost coin, that too was reason to celebrate. But the importance of a lost son being found it is a true cause for rejoicing. As a picture of one sinner repenting, causing heaven to rejoice, the Lord gives this parable to show how the lost Sinning prodigal's repentance and return caused untold great rejoicing in his father's house, which is the picture of heaven. If you have not trusted Christ as your personal Savior, God the Father is watching and waiting for you. And he wants you to come to the Savior. And trust Christ that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. This is how we come home under grace, by grace, through faith alone, and what Christ did for us by his death, and that he rose again the third day. And that that moment when you trust Christ to save you, though you were spiritually dead in your sins, now you live. And though you were spiritually lost, now you're found. And when one trusts Christ to save your heaven erupts in praise and explodes in rejoicing. And when that day comes, when you enter glory, you will be welcomed by the Father and blessed with all the privileges of heaven by His great kindness and amazing grace. Thank you for watching Transformed by Grace. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society. P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.